Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Do you realize how much time we spend complaining? I mean, I think about that. You know, I'll be watching television. I'll complain about a commercial. I'll complain about a call on a on a on a football field the ref makes. You know, I'll, I'll complain about some <laughs> TV show that isn't funny or supposed to be funny. And I'm sitting there and I realize, man, I have complained all evening long. It becomes a habit, and it's not a good habit, Mark Halleck. No. Good to see you, by the way. Good to be here. I'm with Mark Halleck in his church in uh, Inglewood, Colorado. We're out here with Kyle Beerman, and we're putting these podcasts together yep. because we care about you. And listen, we got a two-parter here, all right? This is a good one, really good one. Twelve ways to cure complaining. I mean, listen, if you're a pastor who has a habit of complaining, dude, that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, just your whole facial expressions, the way you, you know, I, I follow a lot of pastors online, good friends, and sometimes, man, their social media, everything on their social media is complaining about somebody or yeah. something yeah. or the government or science or churches or denominations. Like, yeah. dude, I don't want to be around you. What, what's up with yeah. that? And sucking every, the life out of every, me. Every sucking the life yeah, out of me. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you don't even know you're doing it sometimes. I know. And what's scary is how that affects our families and how it affects our churches. Listen, yes. we don't like complainers in our churches. Right. And I would say, well, man, where are they learning that from? You Absolutely. Know? And sadly, a lot of times it could be us. And secondly, have you ever been around somebody for a while and you realize they don't ever complain? Mm. If something bad goes wrong, they don't complain. Yeah, yeah. If they have to wait in a... Re- and I'm so bad about that. If I have to wait too long in a retail place or wait too long in a restaurant or yeah. wait too long at the car rental counter, yep. what about the guy who just doesn't he doesn't complain about it? I know. He's. I mean, there's this graciousness and Amen. I want to be I around know. that. That's right. Exactly. And, and as a pastor, man, you got to you got to model that for your people. And then you've got folks in your church that are just constant complainers. And i got to be careful about this, but some of you have family members who are complainers, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. so how do you work with them? So our friends at Christian Communicators Worldwide, that's Jim Elliff's organization, we lean into them a lot. Um, They've written really a great article here on 12 points to cure complaining. Very helpful. Extremely very, helpful. Very practical, helpful. I think this would be a really helpful yeah, couple and it, episodes. Yeah, and if you don't like this and you complain about it, well, that's your problem. <laughs> it's on you. <laughs> it's on that's you. On. We're working hard here, guys. That's right. All right, number one. Okay, number one, here we go, is that God commands me never to complain. Oh, he does not. He, he, this is true. Where? The Bible actually oh, teaches where this. where in the Bible does God well, say that? Well, let's look at you know Philippians 2.14. Yeah. says pretty clearly, Paul writes, do all things without complaining and disputing oh yeah i forgot about that yeah i know sorry all things burst your bubble all things that's right at the car rental line all things all things in the deacons meeting what are some things that all things when the church doesn't give you a raise all things when the church actually has to reduce your salary all things when that lady in church gives your wife the stink eye because the kids aren't dressed right Mm. do all things without complaining Wow. Where do we find the strength to do that? Well, we'll come to that. We'll we certainly don't that. find it in ourselves. We don't find it in ourselves. Why is it so easy to complain? Because let's be honest, it doesn't take much work to be a complainer. Because we're fallen. I love what R.C. Sproul, I, I, I looked at this, this mug the other day. You know, Last year, I gave everybody on our team uh, our, a mug that said, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> That's a great, it's clip, a great, clip, by the a way. great line, yeah, yeah. especially when you deal with dying churches, yeah, yeah. right? But uh, I and Kyle sitting here. No, you're not getting this mug. I didn't get this one, but uh, I saw a mug this year from uh, R.C. Sproul that said, uh, "I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not a sinner because I sin. Um, I sin because I'm a sinner. Mm. I'm not a sinner yeah. because I sin." I sin because I'm a a sinner. sinner. Why do I complain? Because I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. Because I'm fallen. It it is absolutely 100% a a sign of of my humanity and my fallen nature that I complain. 
It's our depravity. Yep. And and listen, you cannot say, well, that's just the way I was wired. Yep. Well, maybe it's the way you're wired, but if you're a child of God and you've been regenerate, that's it. Uh, Colossians or Galatians two twenty says, "I am crucified with Christ." Nevertheless, I live, and the yeah. life I live now, I live not by yeah. the flesh, but the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That part of you died. That's right. That's you you right. can't you can't say, well, that's just the way I am. Yes. No, if if you're a Christian, that part died. So, Amen. I well, think that's com- why complaining's Paul, a sin. Well, dude, that's why Paul says, "Do all things without complaining and dispute." He's saying that because you can actually live that way if you are in Christ. You can imagine when Paul was when Paul was arrested in Philippi. He's a Roman citizen. He's not supposed to be arrested. Mm. He's arrested in Philippi, and he's beaten, right? And and he he and Silas are are, are probably they're like they're like tethered to probably a, a pole in the inner darkest part of that prison. You can't imagine how bad it smelled. You can't imagine how dark it was. And and seriously, guys and ladies, listen. With swollen lips and eyes that were blackened, he sang at midnight. Mm. He didn't complain. He didn't moan. He didn't gripe. And the reality was the jailer heard him. If he complained all night long, nobody would have listened to him. Let me tell you why people do not listen to the church or to our message today is because far too often all they hear us do is complain like the rest of the world. Wow. Wow. Well, that's good. And that's number one. God commands me never to complain. And it leads right into number two, which is God commands me to give thanks in every circumstance. So we're not we're not to complain. Instead, we're to do something else. Yeah. We're and not just to, to be quiet things. about it. That's right. That's right. First Thessalonians 5.18, in everything, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you in all circumstances, in all situations. And uh, and that can be difficult. That can well, be tough. Of course tough. it is. But this is also where, again, I think you made a really good theological distinction that's important, is... We aren't who we once were. We are right. in Christ now. We have been justified. Right. We're being sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit to be those who actually do give thanks in all circumstances. In the midst of your trial, in the midst of the pain you're experiencing in your church, in the midst of never being encouraged, all of these things, we are called to give thanks because the Lord is good. Yes. <laughs> the Lord is sovereign. Absolutely. And he's working out his purposes for his glory and, and our joy. In and him. when we're not thankful, we're really showing our lack of faith in who he is totally. and his sovereignty. You know, as, as we're going through this list, actually, we don't we don't spend a lot of time on preparation on these things. Uh, we, we love doing them, but uh, it's not like we spend hours preparing these, all right? We, you, we don't. Maybe you don't. Oh, okay. All right, okay. But here's what I was I, I sort of do – we sort of prepare it as we – we build it as we go, all yeah. right? But but I was thinking as I was looking at this, this would be awesome if, if a pastor wanted to take a month, and every month you put in your worship bulletin, uh, man, God commands us never to complain, mm-hmm. and then have and, – and put the scripture in there, Philippians 2.14, do all things without complaining. And then have a month where we just – we just every time you're, yeah. you you meet on Sunday morning, and just, hey, what's our verse we're looking at this month? Yeah. We're not going to complain. We'll hold each other to that, and we're yeah. going to quote this verse. And then next month, maybe, you mm-hmm. know, God commands me not only not to complain, but to give thanks. You could take these that yes. we're going to place in these show notes, and you could use them really as discipleship, you know, jumping off points, even in your church, even on Sunday morning. I, I think – People would be benef- benefit greatly from that, and I think it'd be a, a good a good thing to and do. Here's what else it does, Mark. It creates culture. Mm-hmm. We talk a lot about in church revitalization. You have to create new culture in the sense of if you're walking into a church that is a very discouraged, critical, complaining environment. Well, guess what? You're, as a leader, you've got to help change the temperature by the power of the Spirit to make that a joyful culture, to make that a thankful culture. And here's what happens over time: as you lead in that. People will catch that. Yeah, they will. And over time, here's what happens. The complainers start to stick out like a sore thumb. That's right. Because that's not what we do in this no. church. We encourage each other. Right. We are joyful in the Lord. And the culture shifts. But I think what you just said is a great strategy to begin yeah. planting some seeds. Hey, yeah. we are a church. We're not a complaining people. No. We're, we're a people who 
give thanks in all circumstances. And as a pastor, you're going to have to catch yourself because you're going to complain a lot. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, who Hold did you accountable? Yeah, who left these lights on or who didn't lock that door or or how come this isn't working right here? You're going to have to quit doing that. That's now, right. That's not you don't point things out, but you know what I mean. It's true. You don't it's have true. a gripey, complaining that's attitude. Right. So number one, God commands us never to complain, Philippians 2, 14. And then that he does command us, though, to give thanks in all things. And number three goes right along with number two. God commands me to rejoice always and especially in times of trial. Now, there are three verses here. Uh, number one, obviously the one we knew as a child, Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Come on now. Rejoice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. We did not plan this. All right, we didn't. Good job. People have turned that off right now. That's your that's your that's your opening uh, <laughs> worship song next that's Sunday right. morning. That's so right. there rejoice you go. In the Lord. But Philippians four four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Give me another one. Okay, we've got First Thessalonians five sixteen, which is rejoice always. Just rejoice always. Yeah. And in James one two, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Wouldn't it be great if our church was a place where when people walked in, they realized this is a place where people are truly joyful. Yeah, yeah. And and yes, they may be going through great great trauma and difficulty in their life, and it's not a it's not a phony happiness. Yeah. But it, it's a deep joy that says my struggle, my cancer, the loss mm-hmm. of my loved one is my grief is informed by the hope of the gospel Amen. and the certain joy that is yet to come. Yes, yes, that's to right. To walk into that kind of environment in a world that's full of people complaining and oh, arguing man. and fussing and discouraged. You know, I told you, I really think that Jesus, I I know he builds his church, and, and he will bring people to a church mm. that express joy in him. Yeah, yeah. It's contagious, man. I mean, it's otherworldly. I mean, it's otherworldly when people, I mean, just think about people you know who have the joy of the Lord or churches. You want to be around those people. You yeah. want to be in that place. Yeah. And so I agree, man, especially... Uh, you know, the, you know, old Stephen Curtis Chapman back in the day when I was a new Christian and a lot of his music discipled me early on because I wasn't in a church that did much discipleship. And he had a song called, uh, what kind of joy is this? Okay. And I remember just going, I never really thought about it. Yeah. And he's like, man, in the face of suffering, in the face of pain, what kind of joy that you would continue to worship the Lord? And it's like, that is a supernatural joy that only comes by the power of the spirit that says, man, even in the midst of my pain, God is at work here. And I love this number four, all right? This is this is hard, but it's so good when you grasp it. And, and Mark, when your church begins to be a church where the dominant membership feels this, mm. it, it just changes everything. Mm. Number four, I always deserve much worse than what I'm suffering. Oh. <laughs> In fact, I deserve hell. Yep. Anytime we think, man, I don't deserve this. I shouldn't be going through this. Why is this happening to me? We have to stop and say, man, I deserve eternal hell. That's the truth. The the wages of sin is death. I I deserve death. I've received life. I've already received far more... You know, the the again, I think it was, again, it's R.C. Sproul quote, uh, you know, uh, why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> and R.C. Sproul said that only happened to once, and he died on a cross That's and rose right. again. That's there right. was only one good person, Amen. right? That's the truth. So uh, the rest of us get what yes. we, 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 we don't get what yeah. we deserve. Yeah, yeah. And that, all that does, guys, when you kind of communicate that to your congregation and to yourself, it gives you a healthy sense of perspective. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Of what you've received. I mean— um, yeah, the, the financial struggles we go through, the conflict in the church, the people who cause us problems, you know, our physical ailments and pain, the, the loss of our parents or our loved ones. Those, those are, sure, this world is a world. Jesus was acquainted with sorrows and very much a, right. a, a person who knew about grief. But at the same time, uh, that grief is informed by hope. And at the same time, Look what we don't get that yes, we should that's get. Right. That's Look right. what our inheritance is. That's right. right. Well, and this is why, you know, Jerry Bridges kind of popularized years ago the idea of, of preaching the gospel to yourself yes. every day. And there's two sides to that. Mm-hmm. One is the hope of the gospel, the good news, that 
I am in Christ. I have been saved by Jesus. My salvation is secure. But the fl- the other side of the gospel is there's bad news. That's right. There's bad news. Yeah. And the bad news, there's you know it's another Sproul quote. You know the good <laughs> news isn't that good until you know how bad the bad news is. <laughs> That's right. Know? And as Jerry would say, but as we preach the gospel, it reminds us, it puts us in our place in the right way that we are sinners and apart from God, all we deserve is His wrath. Right. Forever. And yet in Christ, we've been forgiven and reconciled, and that is our hope. So the gospel keeps us humble. The gospel makes us a thankful people. Right. Even in the midst of suffering. Good stuff. 12 points to cure complaining. Number five, in light of eternal happiness and glory that I will experience in heaven, this present trial is extremely brief and insignificant, even if it were to last for an entire lifetime. Give us a couple of verses on that one, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 39, excuse me, I'm sorry, I read the wrong one. 2 Corinthians 4, 19. The sufferings of this present time are not worth worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Sorry, that was Romans 8, 18. Man, I couldn't have messed that one up. <laughs> no, but that's okay, but let me keep but going. But I'm not complaining no, no, that you're not doing you this well. You shouldn't. <laughs> but, but listen to this too, but let me go back to 2 Corinthians 4, 19. For our light affliction. Yes. So Paul says our light affliction. Yes. Which is but for a moment. Yes. Is working for us. I mean, this is incredible. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Yes. Can, do you know people, can you think of, you know, the one that comes to my mind is, is Johnny Erickson Tata. Yeah. But I think of folks, godly men and women who have suffered, um, in very significant ways for a long time. Right. And yet have remained faithful. Faithful. Their joy in the Lord. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata was paralyzed as a teenage right. girl. Right. Um, it's, God has used her in amazing ways. Um, but, you know, that that is, that's something that many of us haven't experienced. Can you think of people or as a person? I can. And I'm going to give you one yeah. you're never going to expect. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but as we do that, I, I, just, I do want to read Romans 8, 18. The suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And again, in 2 Corinthians 4, 19, for this light affliction, which is but a moment, is working far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Okay, here's something you would not have expected. I saw I saw a biography the other night of Lex Luger. Remember right. Lex Luger? I didn't expect that to come out. Lex anymore. Luger, the, the wrestler? Oh, yeah, totally. Ago. Big, oh, yeah. big wrestler. WCW. I mean, WCW. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, lived a really, really raucous life. I mean, was in jail several times. Mm. Uh, very, I mean, drugs and everything you can imagine, man. Huge, was, blonde hair, huge good-looking blonde dude. Huge, blonde hair, just, the total yeah. package oh, yeah, or what they yeah. called him, right? So I was watching it, and this guy, he's my age, all right? He's 64, is what I am. So I was watching it, and he comes on the screen Oh my gosh, he looks like he's eighty, and he's he's mm. he's he's pencil. He's like a pencil. He's like totally thin, right? Mm. And so I'm go, what in the world? And I listened to his testimony, and dude, he was in jail. And when he was in jail, this uh, uh, Baptist pastor in Atlanta was visiting all the jail people in jail, and he'd always want to talk to Lex, and Lex wanted nothing to do with him, and would even cuss him out and all that stuff. But eventually, uh, Lex realized I could get out of my cell for a while if I'd go listen to him. And long story short, we'll get into it, he was radically converted, mm, all right? Mm-hmm. Radically converted. But he acknowledged in this testimony, he, you know, he, he was still the total package, man. He still had it all yeah, going yeah, on yeah. physically and everything, and he still had a lot of temptations, a lot of... The, but not long after he was converted, he, he suffered um, just on an airplane, just something snapped in his spine, and it was a nerve injury. Basically, he's paralyzed, and his body has shriveled up to really nothing. Hmm. But he said, you know, the joy I have now, it was like God, he, it was, it said, I can't say it exactly, you'll have to watch his testimony, but it was something to the effect that he knew I was struggling with all my physical body and mm-hmm. all that. So he just took that away and I couldn't be more happy than I am now, more wow. joyful than I am now. And even in this broken, frail body, because I know what real joy is. Man, that's, isn't that, oh, that's incredible. only Christ can do Amen. that. Amen. And when you see him on screen, he's really joyful. Yeah. Yeah. It's genuine. You can't fake Look that. Look it up. You'll find it. It's on YouTube. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing testimony. Wow. And it's, it's a Baptist, Baptist pastor wow. who just wow. went to the jail. Yeah. Like we're supposed to do. Yeah. And who Preach knew? the gospel. Isn't yep. that cool? What that is awesome. Story. I'm glad you right. shared that. There you go. Okay, so here's number six. This is the last one we're going to look at today. My suffering is far less than that which Christ suffered, and he did not complain. First Peter 2, 23. 
Oh, man. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Mm. Boy, live like that. Live oh. like that. So, guys, we're going to place these uh, on our show notes, and you might want to use these in your own life, maybe every day for a few weeks, and pray through them and then share them with your congregation so that first you as a pastor becomes a person who breaks that habit of complaining, and then you help your church do that as well. Hey, if we've been helpful to you, we're grateful. Uh, check us out at churchreplanners.com, and please, by all means, subscribe and share this podcast. It helps us get the word out. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.